And good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Health Nexus Virtual Family and Caregiver Retreat. We're really pleased that you're taking some time out of your busy evening to attend, and we're hoping that you will take something out of the retreat too that you can use in your lives, in your personal wellness, and um, that will help. That will help you. Um, before we start, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. So uh, we will begin this uh, virtual caregiver retreat by acknowledging that we are meeting on Aboriginal land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. As settlers, we're grateful for the opportunity to meet here and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Long before today, as we gather here, there have been Aboriginal peoples who have been the stewards of this place. In, and we recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions of Métis, Inuit and other Indigenous peoples who have made both in shaping and strengthening this community in particular and our province and our country as a whole. As settlers, the recognition of the contributions and the historic importance of Indigenous peoples must also be clearly and overtly connected to our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and recon reconciliation real in our communities, and in particular to bring justice for murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls across our country. And with that, I would just like to say that this session, uh, nutrition and mental health, is a good fit for all of us, both settlers and Indigenous peoples alike. We need both of those. We need to feed the body and feed the spirit and feed all our senses as well. And that is really important. Um, just a few words about Health Nexus. That's where I am from. Um, my name is Hiltrud Dawson. I am um, the team lead at Health Nexus. I've been there for quite a while, 16 years. Some people may have seen emails from me or may know me in some way. Um, I am happy to be there. It's a great place to work. Um, we do work on health promotion um, projects and some of our projects right now that we've been working on in particular is uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and as part of that we have um, put together this virtual retreat it consists of four four sessions and i'm hoping that you'll be able to answer all to attend all of those um, a few small housekeeping things um, we have a question and answer. So along the bottom of your screen, you should see a few icons. There's a Q&A icon. So please, if you have questions, type them into that. Um, our presenter, Andrea, will be um, pausing at the end. We will have plenty of time for questions. So type any questions in that come to your mind. There's also a raise hand. So is, if there is some reason you need to bring attention to yourself, raise your hand. Um, uh, or if you have a technical question, you can either raise the hand and put it in the question box and our production team will take care of you that way. Um, yeah, I think that's probably all I want to say. You are, are all unmuted, um, but we will work with the questions to make sure that all of you are heard. Um, okay, and with that, I would just like to welcome Andrea. Um, Andrea Fennell is a registered, experienced registered dietitian that specializes in fertility and hormone health. Her strong interest in nutrition began with her own health journey with stubborn skin and digestive issues. After pursuing her nutritious studies, she discovered that her issues and those commonly seen in her clients were actually stemming, stemming from her gut health. She now specifically supports women in getting to the root causes of their symptoms, including infertility, digestive issues, irregular cycles, stubborn weight, chronic fatigue, and anxiety. Her goal is to empower others to take charge of their health and to feel the absolute best through personalized nutrition. 
Andre will also be doing a food demo for us today and sharing some nutrition tips on how to manage stress by supporting the body's nutrient needs, improve digestive health and why it's essential to mental health, optimize sleep and hormone health, and choose and prepare easy, nutritious snacks. So with that, I would just like to welcome Andrea right now. Thank you, Hiltrude. Hi, everyone. So yes, I'm Andrea Fennell. Um, I'm a registered dietitian. And I'm chatting with you guys all things nutrition and mental wellness. So I'm going to be kind of describing a few sciencey terms. So I'm going to do my best to really break them all down. Um, but overall, I really want to give you guys some practical tips. Um, so I want to leave, leave you guys with lots of tips. Um, and I hope this applies to each of you guys. We're also going to have a five minute pee break. So get cozy now. Um, and then about halfway through, we'll take a five minute break. And then after the five minute break, I'm going to do the food demo. Um, and you will get that recipe sent out to you after um yeah so we'll get started so again i'm a registered dietitian and i practice here in ontario um, i've been a registered dietitian for seven years but i'm originally from cape breton island in canada um, i do virtual sessions so i see clients one-to-one -one virtually at the moment um, and i specialize overall in women's hormone health so i want to say i'm more of a functional uh, dietitian. So what that means is I kind of look more closely at the root cause of things. Um, so there's always a root cause to your symptoms. So I always say, you know, your body best. And if you feel like there's something going off, there's something off, um, you're likely right. So always kind of tune into your body and what how you're feeling. And again, symptoms, there's always an underlying cause. Um, Often we turn to quick fixes or kind of a bandage approach to our symptoms. Um, but we need to address what's going on at the root cause. Um, and like Hiltrude mentioned, kind of my health history is I got to the root of it. Um, so I had really bad skin issues and I tried all the creams, um, but I got to the root, which was the gut health, which I'm going to talk a lot about today. Um, so I want to start with stress response. So stress response would be obviously our stress, right? Um, but when we get into a stress response, we're in a fight or flight. So what that means is way back in the day, we used to either fight the bear or run away from the bear. So now we have this stress um, response where, you know, we're cooping up all this energy, um, it's creating havoc on our body. And often we don't have the, the greatest stress management approach. Um, and I want to mention too is adrenal glands. So your adrenal glands is what pumps out our cortisol, which is our stress hormone. And I'm going to talk to you guys a lot about how we can support those adrenal glands. So naturally, we're going to pump out cortisol. Um, it is our safety mechanism. Um, but there's lots of things we can do to reduce the effects of that cortisol on our health. So we're going to get into that. Um, so one tip I want to start with is looking at your vitamins and minerals. So one for managing cortisol, the stress hormone is your B vitamins. This is a big one, especially for females as well, is B vitamins, think of them as like your warrior vitamins. So they're there to combat stress. So in times of heavier stress, we tend to eat up those B vitamins very quickly. And B vitamins are water soluble. So we need them daily, we pee them out daily. So we need to replenish them daily. So often a good quality B complex is really helpful um, if you're experiencing higher stress levels. But also there's lots of foods that you can consume as well. One I want to focus on is uh, B6. So B6 is in sunflower seeds, sweet potatoes, spinach, those are some kind of the bigger food groups. But this one's really important for mood. So if you feel irritable, anxious, um, that's more B6, low, being low in B6. So those are kind of some foods to focus on for that one. Another big one I want to talk about is magnesium. So think of magnesium as like your calming mineral. And now magnesium is another one that gets eaten up with stress. And if there's any chocoholics out there or anyone who really likes their chocolate or have 
has cravings for chocolate. And now usually it's more the chocolate itself, not the sweetness. Um, so if any kind of sweet candy will do, it's not, it's not so much that, but if you specifically go for chocolate, well in chocolate, there's cocoa and cocoa is one of the highest food sources of magnesium. So I often say there's a reason for your cravings. So if you have lots of cravings for chocolate, you might just need some extra magnesium in your diet. Um, so consider that. And then some other food sources are your dark leafy greens. So this would be like spinach, romaine lettuce, um, your kale, Swiss chard, um, arugula, your spring mix. So all your dark leafy greens, that would be also high in magnesium. And then some other foods are avocados um, and pumpkin seeds. So those are all really high sources of magnesium. And then I want to quickly touch on caffeine. So this is kind of different for everyone. Everyone reacts to caffeine differently. And now some people can tolerate, you know, a few cups a day. Some people can only tolerate one cup a day. Some people really need to limit it. So it really depends on how you metabolize it. But one thing that coffee does, or caffeine, I should say, is it also eats up magnesium. The other thing it does is it also shoots up that stress hormone cortisol. So if you are a coffee drinker or you have a form of caffeine in your daily, is you want to pair it with some food. Because what food does is it stabilizes blood sugar, which we're going to get into, um, but it helps to reduce that cortisol effect. So you don't want to have it on an empty stomach because that's just going to shoot up your cortisol, um, which puts you in that stress response. So that's the thing with caffeine. And really, if you feel like you're, at, you're not dealing with stress well, you feel really anxious, you might want to look at your caffeine intake. Another thing to consider is inflammation. Now, we have acute inflammation, which would be if you got a cut, then it gets swollen. Um, so that's all acute inflammation. But the problem is chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation is impacting things like the cortisol stress response. Um, now, things that are inflammatory in our diet that could be inflammatory is your refined sugars, um, refined oils and alcohol. So refined sugars would be like your white sugar, brown sugar, um, lots of different names that you'll see on ingredients labels and some good swaps for those, which I'm going to get into in the food demo as well is things like pure maple syrup. Um, honey is another one. Coconut sugar is a good one. So those are all more blood sugar balancing, which again, in turn helps the cortisol response. Whereas refined sugars are very processed and they create that inflammation in the body. So looking at your overall refined uh, sugar intake. And then now refined oils, to quickly touch on that, is your canola oil, corn oil, all your vegetable oils, basically. And some alternatives would be your olive oil, avocado oil. Those are less inflammatory to the body. And the obvious one is the alcohol. And then on the flip side, what we can do as well is up the anti-inflammatory foods. So this would be going back to those dark leafy greens, your veggies and fruits, um, and then some big ones are your omega threes. So omega three is a type of essential fatty acid and your omega threes are highly anti-inflammatory and what the food sources include are fatty fish. So think of like salmon, white fish has a little bit, but the fatty fishes have more. So salmon, um, and then some plant-based sources would be your flax seeds, uh, walnuts and chia seeds. So including more of those in your diet is going to help to reduce inflammation as well. And then two herbs I want to touch on uh, is ginger and turmeric. So these are super anti-inflammatory. You can actually get capsule form. Um, and some of them are as eff effective as medications such as Tylenol. So Tylenol is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. So it helps to reduce inflammation in the body. So it helps to get rid of those headaches because it reduces that, in, that inflammation, helps reduce pain because of inflammation. So ginger and turmeric can be as potent as some medications. So incorporating ginger and turmeric into your diet would look like adding um, ginger tea. You could add fresh ginger to a stir fry. Um, you could do like a pumpkin spice. So that would be cinnamon, uh, ginger, nutmeg. 
you could add that into your oats. You could add that into a smoothie, um, into your baking, making things with ginger and baking. And then turmeric is another root or you can get it in powder form. And it has like a peppery flavor. So I usually suggest adding turmeric into anything that kind of calls for pepper. So it could be into soups, stews, um, kind of any dish people add it to their eggs as well. So kind of um, looking into those two herbs. Another thing is curry powder. So curry powder actually has turmeric in it. So if you make anything with curry, that's also a form of um, a way to get in turmeric as well. And now the biggest one for the stress response is blood sugar control. So I'm going to touch on this next. Um, and the blood sugar control is going to tie in with our food demo. So in terms of snacks and having protein at your snacks, which is really, really key. So to go back to the sciencey terms here again, um, insulin resistance, I want to chat about. So insulin is the hormone that helps the sugars get into the cells. So basically when you eat food, it gets broken down into glucose and that glucose, the sugar needs to get into our cells to be used, but we need the insulin hormone to get that into the cells. And now insulin resistance is when they're the, we can, we're not responding to the insulin. So then insulin just keeps getting pumped out because there's sugar circulating and it's not going into the cells. So more and more insulin gets pumped out. So that's called insulin resistance when we're not properly using our insulin. And what happens is insulin is actually our fat storing hormone. So if you think about it, if there's lots of insulin getting pumped out, then we're going to hold on to weight more easily. So you're going to have struggles with losing weight. Um, some people gain more weight as well. And the other thing is with the insulin resistance is you'll also think, see things like um, poor sleep as well. Irregular periods is another one. And some other symptoms of blood sugar dysregulation, um, and I'm going to get into some tips here, is you might feel more anxious if your blood sugars are out of whack, um, and you might have poor sleep as well. So if you're waking up at night, that might be a blood sugar um, symptom as well. So whether you have insulin resistance or not, whether you have diabetes or not, every single person should be looking at their blood sugars in terms of controlling them well and managing them well, because blood sugar, if it's out of, if we're not controlling our blood sugar throughout the day and every day, um, we can go into that cortisol stress response. So in terms of the insulin resistance of blood sugar, it's all about your diet. That's the number one thing to look at is your diet. So to help with blood sugars is the type of carbohydrates you're having in terms of complex versus refined. So think of refined as something's processed, right? So it would be more so the flours and these refined carbohydrates break down very fast. So they're in a flour form and then we digest them very quickly. So then it shoots our blood sugar up quicker. Whereas the complex carbs, think of them as whole foods that grow naturally from the ground. So they're not processed. So think of your oats, your rice, your sweet potatoes, your potatoes, quinoa is another one. Um, those are all complex carbs and they don't shoot up the blood sugar as fast because they have more fiber in them and some have more protein as well. So your refined sugar, your refined carbs will shoot the blood sugar up and then quickly drop it. Whereas your complex carbs will put it up slower and kind of maintain it if it has a little bit of more protein or fiber in it. So basically that's going to do you for your next meal versus having that drop of blood sugar and that stress response. Um, and then the next thing is protein. So you want to include protein at each meal and snack. I always say you want to avoid naked carbs. So try to avoid having just a, a carbohydrate source. So this would be like your grains, fruits, um, dairy, so those are all your carbohydrate uh, sources. Try to pair them with a source of protein at your snacks. So for example, it could be um, any meats, eggs, uh, nuts, seeds, nut butters, a protein bar or higher protein granola bars. Um, so those are all gonna help with blood sugar regulation. And then fiber is another one. So I always just kind of say to hit your fiber for the day is try to focus on looking at your plate at lunch and supper and ask yourself is half this plate vegetables and you want to shoot for more than non-starchy vegetables for half your plate 
it could look like a casserole. It could look like a pizza. Um, you just want to like kind of look at it and think, okay, is half this meal veggies. If it's pizza, you can load on the veggies. You can have a little side salad or raw veggies on the side. Um, so you can always kind of make it work. And I always say, if you're not a big veggie lover is you can definitely make them tasty. You can add lots of sauces and different, you know, vinaigrettes and stuff to them. So there's definitely ways to make them really tasty. I used to be one of those that plugged my nose eating Brussels sprouts growing up. And now they're my favorite food because I know how to flavor them properly and not just make them plain. Um, so you can definitely make veggies tasty. And then the last thing for blood sugar control is meal timing. Um, so you basically just don't want to go too long without eating and you don't want to eat too frequently. So the whole grazing. Um, so you don't want to go usually around six hours or more without eating. That's just too long. And then what happens is your blood sugar drops and you get, you know, hangry, I call it. So hungry and angry, or you get irritable. Um, so basically you just go into that stress response, which is not good on, on the body. So I usually say a three to five hour rule. So you don't want to go again too long, but also not too short between snacks and meals. Cause you want to have time for your, um, your food to digest, right? So you don't want to eat too, too often. So on that note of digestive health is I want to get into to uh, gut health now. So gut health is a big one I talk to with all my clients. Again, I feel I know it starts with the gut health, everything starts with our gut, how we digest our food. Um, our gut is there to absorb nutrients, right? It's uh, there to eliminate toxins in our environment, toxins possibly in our food. So it's kind of like our it has a detox um, component to it as well. And it's there, especially for both male and female, but I again, prominently work with females is it's there to regulate our hormones as well. So if we have a, a gut that is not balanced, which we'll get into what that means, uh, your hormones could be out of whack too. So often gut health is the root cause of hormones being out of whack. So in terms of what gut health looks like, we want to talk about the gut microbiome. So gut microbiome, what I'm talking about is bacteria. So there's actually over um, 10 times more bacterial cells than human, you have more than that than human cells, 10 times more bacterial cells than human cells. So we got a lot of bacteria. And now what we need to focus on is balancing that good and bad bacteria, we have both good and bad bacteria, but often we're seeing an overgrowth of the bad bugs in our system. Um, and I'll get into why this is. Another thing I want to mention is our, our immune system. So our immune system, 80% of it is in our gut. So if we need to focus on helping our immune system, we need to focus first on our, on our gut health. Um, and there's also a huge gut and brain connection. I'm sure you've heard of this before, but most of our serotonin, our happy hormone is made in our gut. And also, if we consume a poor diet one day, you might feel the effects mood wise that day or the following day. So there's a big connection between, you know, how your gut's feeling, and then how your mood is feeling, and your energy is a big one too. And then vice versa, if we're having a very stressful day, um, we might see, you know, diarrhea happening, you might see your food not digesting, um, coming out with, you know, how it went in looking like, right. So think of that as well. So there's a huge gut and brain connection. And I always say it starts in the mouth. So I just want to kind of go through now and explain the digestive system quickly. Um, but basically, and here are some tips is you want to chew, chew, chew your food. So our digestion starts with our mouth. Otherwise, you know, there would just be a tube and you just throw it in kind of thing, right? So you need to chew, chew, chew your food, because if you don't chew enough, then you're putting more work on your stomach, right? Um, so you just want to make sure you chew very well. The other thing as well is, you know, kind of being on the go, right, we might, or we might be distracted and not chew very well. So you want to be more in a calm state, ideally, is sit down and like, you know, tune into your meal. Because also, if we're not in a calm state, and we're kind of in a stressful response or stressful state, then all of our energy actually goes to our nervous system because it's reacting to that stress. And our digestion kind of gets on hold. 
And what happens is we don't digest our food properly when we're in that stressful state. So we want to try to be in a calm state when we're eating. And then, so what happens next is it goes into our stomach and with stomach is a big thing here I see with clients is stomach acid. So low stomach acid, um, and this occurs naturally as we age, but there's lots of things that reduce stomach acid. And this might look like acid reflux or heartburn. Um, but I see a lot of clients on specific medication that reduce the stomach acid. And now if we don't have enough stomach acid, if we have low stomach acid, then our food again, doesn't get digested properly. That stomach acid is there to break down our food. And if we have low stomach acid, then what happens is that food is not digested properly leading into the intestine. So then the intestines um, get the impact and that can actually lead to that overgrowth of that bad bacteria I was talking about. So then the next one is oat the bowels, right? So the biggest thing here is you want to ensure your bowels are moving daily. You're having a bowel movement every day, um, even sometimes up to three times a day. But ideally, the one time a day, you don't want to be skipping days. What happens here is our stool we're trying to eliminate all the junk. We're trying to eliminate toxins, excess hormones, um, our food. And what happens if it's sitting in our intestines and we're not uh, evacuating that every day is those hormones and those toxins get recirculated into the blood system. So it's just not good um, in terms of those detox pathways are kind of clogged up. So you want to get the bowels moving every day. If you are um, not going every day, there is a root cause to that, right? So you want to dig a little dip, bit, dip, dig a bit deeper. And so some um, some things might be lack of water intake, um, lack of fluid intake. I always say just non-caffeinated beverages. Another thing might be a mineral deficiency. So that magnesium is a common one. So magnesium again, it's the calming mineral, so it helps to you know, calm the bowel down and help things to move, um, move well. The other thing is that bad bacteria that could be an overgrowth situation. And then that leads to constipation as well. Another one I see, and especially in women is thyroid issues. So our thyroid is our metabolism, it helps our metabolism. And if we have a sluggish or slow thyroid, again, it's going to impact, it's going to make our bowel sluggish too. Um, and then another big one I see is food sensitivities. And often these are unknown to um, it's not until we eliminate a food and then reintroduce it that we see the impact it's been having. Um, you might feel like a low energy has been kind of like your normal. Um, you might feel like that skin's been your normal, but it's not until, you know, you, you, you eliminate those. Hmm. I wonder if that's a, if it's a food sensitivity to, for me and then reintroduce, reintroduce it. Some other, so some red flags for digestive um, imbalance might be again, the heartburn I was, I was mentioning, constipation, diarrhea, um, bloating. Bloating is a big one I see too. Bloating, basically what that is, is just our, our gut is not happy. Um, and the other thing is stubborn weight. Um, stubborn weight can often just be our gut as well. That is imbalanced uh, skin conditions, like I mentioned earlier your mood I mentioned earlier. And then if you're low energy or you're not sleeping well, um, and then for women, irregular cycles, PMS, um, you should only be experiencing mild PMS, not, you know, being super irritable or um, having really bad, severe cramps. That's not normal. So you want to look into that too. Um, and then another big one is going back to the cravings is if you are more of a sweet or carby um, person, if you like more of the, the sugar and the carbs, that could be the bad bacteria overgrowth because that those bad bugs actually feed off of sugar and carbs. So those are the guys that are screaming out and being like, give me more sugar. So you might want to look at if you are experiencing that again, your gut health. So I just want to quickly mention some tips for your gut health. Um, so fermented foods. So people always ask me about probiotic supplements and I always say my approach is more food first. Um, so looking at probiotic foods. So what's naturally high in probiotics and probiotics are those good bacteria. So fermented foods, and this kind of goes back to our traditional foods. 
is uh, sauerkraut. So sauerkraut is fermented cabbage. And it's when it's fermented, it grows those really good bacteria. So sauerkraut you can get in the dry section, the grocery store, but that wouldn't be live bacteria. You want to get it in the refrigerator section. So usually it's kind of in like that health food section of the grocery store. And now one tablespoon of that is equivalent to a probiotic capsule. So it's super high in probiotics and ways you can kind of incorporate it because it's kind of like a pickled food. So it tastes kind of pickly is you can add it to meats um, on the side of your plate. People like to add it to their eggs. People put it in salads. Um, so you can kind of get creative with it. But again, you just don't want to heat it. You want to keep it cold and in the refrigerator that keeps the bacteria alive. Um, and then another one, um, common one is kefir, which is fermented uh, yogurt or milk. And then kombucha. So kombucha is fermented tea, which is kind of a, a thing that people are making these days. So kombucha is another version of a probiotic um, food. And you want to shoot for the lower sugar ones when you are purchasing the kombucha. So there can be some that are qu quite high in sugar. Um, another thing too for gut health is fiber. So prebiotics feed probiotics and prebiotics are your veggies. So another reason to up your veggies, um, any kind of veggies, um, but the biggest two for prebiotics are garlic and onion. So if you like garlic and onion, up those garlic and onion, um, and then limit the refined sugars, like I mentioned earlier, that's feeding the bad bugs. And then medications, I just want to quickly mention is if you have recently taken antibiotics or have um, taken a lot of antibiotics in the last few years, is you want to look at replenishing your good bacteria because antibiotics will flush out the bad bacteria, but also a lot of the good bacteria. So again, trying to incorporate more of those, those probiotic rich foods. Um, and then another one too is uh, those Tylenol and Advil is you want to try to turn to the root cause of whatever it is, the headaches, the pain, um, and choosing more of the anti-inflammatory foods because those medications can also um, create havoc on the gut health too. Um, so I want to now move on so that we talked about blood sugar. Um, we talked about the gut health is the next one sleep. So I always say sleep is queen um, and sleep is free. So if you can better your sleep routine, your sleep hygiene, that's going to do so much. It's going to make your diet a lot easier to follow. It's going to make, you know, movement a lot easier to do. And so to explain how sleep comes in here is when we are sleeping, our cortisol, our stress hormone goes down. So kind of picture it like you go on with your day and your cortisol, your stress hormone is going up and up and up. And then we go to bed at night and then it starts to go back down. But if we get lack of sleep, sometimes it just stops there. And then we add more stress on from the, for the next day. So adequate sleep helps us to reduce that cortisol down. Um, and so again, it's free. So really try to focus on that versus, you know, what supplement can I take? Um, you know, spending lots of money on fad diets and that too is first start with your sleep. And I'm a registered dietitian, but I tell my clients sleep is probably way more important than your diet. So focus on your sleep first. Um, usually you want to aim for at least seven hours. That seems to be kind of where everyone benefits is seven hours. And now there's two things I see a lot with clients is trouble falling asleep or trouble staying asleep. And you want to try to support two of these or both of those as well for adequate sleep. You don't want to have broken sleep. And again, there's always a root cause to those two things that we can support through nutrition. So sometimes that falling asleep is kind of feeling wired at night and tired in the morning. So you might feel sluggish in the morning, but wired at night, that might be more of that cortisol imbalance jumping in. So again, we want to look at the blood sugars, the gut health. Um, and then the other thing is the waking up. So if you are waking up during the night, that can be blood sugar dysregulation. So what were you eating at supper or what did you eat before bed? Uh, before bed and at supper, you want to ensure proteins there. If you're having a night snack, I always say 
again, avoid those naked carbs. If you're having a carby snack at night, add protein into it. Because again, the, 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 with the blood sugars, the carb will just up it and then drop it. Whereas if you add protein to that carb, it's going to up it with the carb and then the protein is going to help stabilize it as you sleep. Because when our blood sugar drops as we sleep, that's when we wake up often. So kind of look at what you're having before bed. If you're having a really sugary or high carb um, snack before bed with no protein, you might have trouble um, with sleep or waking up. Other things when you're waking up could be a food sensitivity. It could be more of a gut root balance um, or gut um, imbalance. And then hormones could be at play too. So those are kind of some things that might come with waking up. So I always say it starts with your bedtime routine. And sometimes we just need to self parent ourselves. So you know, how late are you staying up? How late are you on devices? So your phone, looking at watching TV. Because the thing is, at nighttime, our bodies produce melatonin. And melatonin is our sleep hormone. But the problem with devices like computers, phones, TVs, so screens is they have a blue light. And that blue light reduces our melatonin production. So if you're on your computer or watching TV, you might not feel tired because your body's not able to create that melatonin. And so I usually suggest about an hour before bed is you want to shut off all your devices. Um, there's also apps you can get to block some of the blue light out of your phone and your tablets and that. But ideally, it's yeah to shut everything off an hour before bed so you can get to bed on time. The other thing is lights. So our bodies kind of react to the sunlight, right? So sun goes down, it gets dark. And when it gets dark, we start creating that melatonin. So if we have really bright lights on in our house, um, again, melatonin production might be reduced. So having low dim lights on at night. And then the opposite is in the morning when the sun comes up, our cortisol goes up, right? We want that cortisol in the morning because it helps us get out of bed, boosts us with energy. So we want light in the morning. So we want to turn our lights on. We want to open the blinds and get the sun in. So with bedtime routine, another thing too is kind of having a routine. So every night going to bed at the same time, because if you go to bed different times at night, it does mess up with your schedule. You wake up differently too. So trying to get in the same time as, as well, we have kind of our own internal clocks. And then another thing too, is things like tea, like chamomile tea helps you fall asleep. Um, so there's certain teas that you can have to kind of get you in a relaxed mode at night. Um, another thing I suggest to clients too, is journaling. So a lot of clients say they that their mind races at night, they can't fall asleep, um, too much to do tomorrow, or they have a lot on their mind is to get a, any notebook out and just brain dump. What are you thinking about? What's bothering you? And just get it out of your head, write it all out. You can even just crinkle it up and throw it in the garbage the next day. It doesn't matter. Just get all your thoughts out on paper. And that's going to help just kind of clear your head before bed. If it's a to-do list, create that to-do list for the next day. Again, just get all those thoughts out. And another thing to end with for that is you can always end that brain dump with gratitude. So gratitude puts us into a happy state. So it kind of puts us in a positive state versus that fight or flight stress state. So you can always add like one to three things you're grateful and it could be specific to that day, that week, um, but always kind of ending it on that happy, that happy state for the day. So those are some kind of tips for sleep. Um, again, it's free. It's all about habits and our routines. We're all guilty of them. Um, but again, it just kind of comes down to the self parenting. So you know, look at your bedtime routine and what it looks like. Um, maybe make more time in the morning for yourself versus staying up too late. So look at, at the sleep routine. So, Perfect. okay. So I'm going to show you guys how to make, um, oat protein balls. And again, this recipe is going to get sent out. Um, so the whole idea behind snacks 
is to make them with protein in them. So ensuring that there's some form of protein. Ideally, when you're looking at labels, if you want to know if a snack is high enough in protein, is somewhere between four and 10 grams. So if you're looking at something like a granola bar, is does it have four grams at least of protein? Um, so these protein balls, just got to pull up the recipe here. So two of these is equivalent to seven grams of protein. So really awesome for protein content. Um, they're also really great for healthy fats and fiber. So this is going to be really helpful for blood sugar control, um, that stress response. So really awesome recipe. Um, so they're really easy to make really fast. I'm going to show you and you store them in your fridge or freezer and they kind of last very long time. So you can make a big batch of them if you want to. So we're going to start with the ingredients. So I already have in here the nut butter and I hope you guys can all see this. So nut butter wise is you want to choose natural nut butter. So what that means is there's no added sugars and no added salt to it. So it's just plain nuts. So whether it's almond butter, um, peanut butter, sunflower butter is another one. So if it's, if it's nut free, sunflower butter is a good one. This one I'm using, um, is from Costco. So it's just kind of a nut seed mixture. I'm not sure if you can see that. So I've added to give you the ingredient specifics is half a cup of nut butter. And then I'm going to add in oats. So when it comes to oats is if you are an oat eater, um, at breakfast, for example, is you want to choose large flake or steel cut. Again, going back to the refined versus complex and the large flaked or steel cut are going to break down slower. So it's going to help stabilize blood sugar. So you're not hungry an hour or two after breakfast. So these are large flake oats and I'm going to add a cup. And then the next ingredient is hemp hearts or hemp seeds, I should say. So hemp seeds, um, they're actually very high in protein. So I usually suggest hemp seeds, adding it to low protein cereals. It's just a really great ingredient to have on hand to up the protein in your baked goods or snacks. Um, you can usually get it at like bulk stores. You can get it at Costco. You can get it at regular grocery stores in the health food section. Um, this is kind of what they look like. So they're just kind of like small little flakes. Um, they, they taste nutty. So they kind of go in recipes that kind of call for nuts or seeds, but three tablespoons of hemp seeds is 10 grams of protein. So that's almost equivalent to two eggs. So really high in protein. So I'm going to add a quarter cup. And this whole recipe, one, two, three, nine ingredients. Sorry, eight ingredients. So really easy and kind of whip them together. And then the next ingredient is um, I'm using flaxseed. You can use ground flaxseed or ground chia. Now you can buy them ground already or you can get them whole and then just use a coffee grinder and grind them yourself. If you grind them or buy them ground is you want to refrigerate them, keep them in the fridge because they do go rancid if they get kept out um, in warm te warmer temperatures or room temperature. Um, so I'm using a quarter cup and now this is also a good protein source but also healthy fats too. So a good source of fat at your snacks or meals is good for blood sugar control too. Um, and then, you know, a common ingredient is salt. And with salt, you want to get good quality salt. Um, Redmond's real salt is one I use. You can use Himalayan salt too. So you want to get quality salt too. So I'm using half of a teaspoon. And salt actually, it brings out the sweetness and things. So sometimes I actually add a, a pinch into my smoothies to bring out more sweetness versus adding more sweet things. Um, so that's kind of the role of salt when you are baking things. And then vanilla extract, we're gonna use a teaspoon. And then the messy one I gotta add in is honey. Um, so honey ideally is you wanna get local honey. It actually helps your immune system when you get local honey because it comes from local bees. Um, so if you can get local honey, that's the best option. Otherwise, any 
store-bought honey is fine. So I'm gonna do a quarter cup of this messy stuff. And again, this is just a natural sweetener instead of that refined sugar, we're adding in honey, right? So honey, pure maple syrup, um, coconut sugar. Other ones are like dates for recipes. You can make recipes with bananas or um, applesauce for sweetness versus, and then cutting the sugar, right? So all kind of like natural, more natural sweeteners. Um, so this is what I got going on here. And then you want to mix that up. And then the next step, the last step is just adding um, your chocolate chips. So I put in there dark chocolate, 70% at least. Um, again, that's just going back to those refined sugars. You want to reduce the amount of refined sugar in there. Um, but also you just ideally don't want it to be too, too sweet. And if you are a milk chocolate or milk, chocolate eater. Um, I would say, yes, there was 70%. Don't go crazy with like the 85%. You can start small and your body will get used to it. your taste buds, get used to it. So as you, as you start to reduce the sugar in your diet and refined sugars, your gut microbiome changes, right? So the good bugs go up and the bad guys start to die off. So those cravings are less. And you, I see this all the time with clients is the sweetness goes down, sweet cravings. And then when they go back to that sweet food, they find it way too sweet. So I'm just chopping up here. Um, you can, again, use dark chocolate chips. I'm just getting, I got a, I'll show you what's kind here. It's just a dark chocolate bar um, and you just chop it up quickly. Or for convenience sake, just get the, um, the dark chocolate chips. So after this, I'm going to mix it all together and then roll them into balls. So like the size of a golf, golf ball. Um, and again, it's going to make eight balls. So, and you want about two tablespoons of chocolate chips or, um, so I'm going to mix this up and show you what it looks like. And if you have young kids or, you know, kids at home, you can always get them to help you with this. It's a super easy recipe. They can help you roll the balls too. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of roll one for you and just show you. So they're really sticky. Um, so there's one there. And then I just pop them into a bowl and then you put them in the freezer for about um, 15 minutes at least, get them nice and cold and then keep them in the fridge. So store them in the fridge. And then you can ziplock them into separate bags, two each, and then that's your on-the-go snack. Um, so again, a good seven grams of protein, really awesome high protein snack. And again, it's all about those ingredients, those hemp seeds, they really add that protein in there. So that's gonna help stabilize those blood sugars. So I'm going to switch over back over to my sitting area. Um, just bear with me here. I'm gonna rinse my hands off and run over. So I will be right back. Awesome. Yeah, and just to kind of re reiterate what Hiltrud was saying is, um, yeah, I know sometimes um, changing habits can be really overwhelming. They say it can take up to 60 days to change one habit. Um, so yeah, my, my approach is very baby step. So I get my clients to focus on things baby step, step at a time, because it's about lifestyle changes versus again, turning to like a fad diet that's a quick fix. And then we fall off the wagon um, after that diet. My approach is more so changing your habits and your lifestyle for the long term, right? So it's not going to happen overnight. Um, so please, by all means, don't feel, um, overwhelmed. It's more so, you know, start to kind of consider these things and think about them, um, and what the next step you could take to change one of those habits. Right. Um, and then again, once you start to change those habits, you'll see the benefits and it'll make you want to keep doing it. So sometimes it's just taking that first step or trying that one different new breakfast out once a week. Right. So again, make it realistic and, and doable for you. So I wanted to mention, um, just go over in terms of how I see clients is 
again, I'm, I'm virtual. I see clients one-to-one. Um, so what it looks like, just to kind of give you an idea, is we go through an initial assessment together. So we look at your symptoms, medical history, what could be going on at the root of things. So again, if you're experiencing any, um, if you feel, you know, skin issues, or you feel like your hormones are out of whack, if you feel like your PMS is crazy, or your cycles aren't regulated, you can kind of tell there's might be something deeper going on. So what I do with clients is we, you know, we get things like blood work done, looking at your vitamins and minerals. We look at your diet overall, where things could be stemming from if you're not regulating blood sugars properly, um, if there could be possible food triggers. But the big thing that we look at is your symptoms. So again, your body tells you a lot of what could be going on at the root. Um, And then that's our our initial assessment. So it's kind of a big in-depth appointment. And then we do follow-ups. And those follow-ups is where we chat a lot about your specific protocol and what is going to work well for you. And again, it's a big, it's a step-by-step um, broken down approach. So I provide my clients with kind of a personal, personalized um, nutrition plan. And then that includes things like recipes, um, alternative foods, if they need to test out a food trigger for them. So I'm all about swaps and not restriction. Um, restrictive diets don't work. Uh, restricting yourself is painful and it's about enjoying life, enjoying the foods that you enjoy. So I'm all about kind of alternatives and swaps and creative ideas versus um, yeah, unrealistic approach to it. So again, we want to make it long-term. And then again, just going back to long-term habits and making it sustainable for you and realistic as well. And I always say I provide lots of close support to my clients too. So there's email, Um, and tech support. So you can text me with questions and that too between sessions. But the overall goal um, with all the clients I see is, yes, we spend time together. Yes, we do the sessions. um, But at the end of the day, I want you to leave feeling empowered, feeling if you are at a grocery store, a restaurant, or deciding what to make for a meal, you can make the right decisions. You know what to choose, what's going to support your body or your family. So you're not confused because I know there's lots of information out there on Dr. Google, and it can be very overwhelming. So I like to ensure my clients feel very empowered and clear on, on the right nutrition for them. And then again, virtually, I see everyone virtually at the moment. So um, across, across Canada. And then also to quickly note as again, I'm a registered dietitian and a lot of health benefit coverage Um, do cover dietitian services. So it's worth kind of looking into your health benefits. And then also registered dietitian services are also tax deductible too. So considering that as well. Um, And now I do have an offer here for new clients is kind of a free chat. So just kind of any questions you might have, um, if we're, if it's a right fit, if, you know, if you, if you're wondering, is nutrition going to make a difference kind of where you're at, if you want more clarity on that. And just, again, just kind of have a chat is I have kind of a free 20 minute phone call consultation. If anyone has any questions, please feel free. Oh, here's somebody asking about overeating, how to deal with overeating or under eating. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so first thing with, with that is looking at your plate. So sometimes a good mental thing could be eating on smaller plates. So it reduces the amount you put on your plate. And then some of us really feel the need to finish what's on our plate, right? So using smaller plates, if you're out at a restaurant, another good tip is to ask for a takeout container right away, um, because portions can be quite big. And then you can either put it in that container right away. So you don't feel the need to nibble at it or eat it. Um, or kind of do it right at the end but that's kind of a tip for for overeating and then yeah just kind of another tip for that too is kind of looking at it's all about your macros I always say so your fat protein and carbs and sometimes you can do like my fitness pals one so kind of food journal and see where your calories and your macros are at just to kind of give you an idea but if you are feel like you're overeating another thing might be that blood sugar dysregulation so 
if you don't have protein at each meal, um, you're going to eat more of whatever else you're having. So one example is um, pasta. So pasta tends to be a higher carb meal. And there is protein sometimes sometimes on it. But if it has no protein, you're gonna need a lot more pasta, whereas that protein, if it's on your plate, it's going to fill you up. Um, and to go along with that is your fiber. So fiber also fills you up. So having lots of veggies in that that pasta too. So I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Good. And um, I we've got a couple more in the chat box. So uh, hold on. Sorry, I lost the one I had. Uh, there was about coconut kefir. What do you think of that? Yeah, that's a good question. So with the kefir, um, the biggest thing I want to suggest on the kefir is to get it plain and add in your own sweetness, whether it's pure maple syrup or honey, um, because those things, if they're flavored, like even yogurts, they can have a lot of added refined sugars to them. So it kind of counteracts what you're doing it for, right? You're taking the probiotic rich food to reduce the bad bacteria, but then you're feeding them with the sugar. So getting it plain and adding your own sweetness, but yeah, coconut sugar is a good, a good one, just like um, the regular cow's dairy. So yeah, coconut sugar is a good one. Okay. Then we've got a question. Do you have a natural remedy for cold or other uh, disease? And what about cancer prevention? Mm hmm. Yeah, so for colds, um, basically, yeah, you're looking at overall prevention of these things. So supporting your immune system, right? So looking at that stress response, but also really with immune system is looking at your gut health, right? Because 70% of your immune cells are in your gut. So root cause looking at gut health first, and then specific vitamins for for preventing illness will be your antioxidants. So going back to those anti-inflammatory foods, the omega-3s, um, the other ones listed turmeric, ginger, those are all antioxidant rich, but also things like, as we all, most of us know, vitamin C rich foods. So that would be um, any citrus foods, also sweet peppers are really high and, and um, sweet potatoes. Um, looking at your sleep, because if we're not getting enough sleep, that cortisol is high and our immune system goes down with that. So getting adequate sleep is really key for, for prevention there. And then on the topic of the cancer prevention, that also has to do a lot with antioxidant rich foods. Um, so think of like the rainbow, right? Think about all the colors of the rainbow, lots of veggies, lots of fruits. And again, quick tip for that is look at your lunch and your supper is half your plate veggies. And that's kind of a good place to start. Great. Um, another question, ginger and turmeric, is it better to eat them as food or as tablets or capsules? So with the capsule, that's just where you can get um, a larger quantity of it and you can do it more routinely. So I would suggest more the capsule form for something that you're experiencing frequently. So if it is a lot of pain, you're experiencing capsules are great. Um, basically kind of treat them as an alternative to the the Tylenol and the Advil. Um, whereas the food sources, it's good just to incorporate to reduce inflammation overall, but it wouldn't have that quick um, necessarily effect like the capsules would. Um, so you can get either or in, in capsule form. And on that note of supplements is I want to really mention that supplements, um, you can get really poor quality supplements. So you want to be careful with that and go to ideally a health food store health food stores would have good quality supplements, whereas somewhere is like, um, you know, like a shoppers that sells a lot of different things, they would have good and, and bad quality supplements and brands. So going to a health food store, you know, you're getting a good quality supplement. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's another one related. Oh, no, that's yeah, I think we answered that one. So um, uh, here's another one that's I've been having a lot of diarrhea. What I can, can I do to stop this? I'm thinking it's from oily foods or pastries. Yeah, so with diarrhea is it's all the, the gut, right? The gut's not happy. Um, so with diarrhea, yeah, there could be a specific food trigger for you causing it. Um, again, you know yourself best. So if you feel like it's fatty foods or pastries or things like that, rich foods or sugary foods, it might be again, that gut imbalance where there's an overgrowth of bad guys. So we need to reduce the refined 
um, flours, refined sugars, and then up the prebiotics in your diet. Um, and then also too, if you feel like it's more on the fatty food side, sometimes that can be a, um, more of a gallbladder and bile production issue. So looking at if that's a possible thing too, and there's lots we can do to support that um, through diet or supplements too. So again, it's, it's tricky though to, to know your specific situation, um, but yeah, gut health would be at the root of that. So then here's a comment, uh, com quite different. So I'm working with FASD children and this is happening a lot. And the person who put the comment in may want to add a little bit more because I'm not sure if that was relating to a specific thing that Andrea said. Maybe just um, add a little bit more into the chat box there. Um, okay, what have we not answered? Dairy um, and egg sensitivity. What can be done about that? Uh, dairy and egg sensitivity, which are very common, uh, food triggers, it all has to do with the protein in them. Um, so again, if you feel like it's a trigger for you, the best thing to do is eliminate them for four weeks and then reintroduce them to see how you do with it. Um, but just again, focusing on the swaps. So choosing more coconut based things versus, uh, dairy. So looking at lots of, of substitutes for that. Um, but sometimes if you feel like it's, it's not a good, if it's triggering something or inflammation, then it's worth testing it out. Mm -hmm. Good. And um, did you mention legumes or are they not an effective substitute for animal proteins? Uh, so yeah, good question. So for substitute for animal proteins, definitely. So your legumes would be like your beans, lentil. So they're high in protein, but I always say for those who are on the, the vegetarian side is you got to keep in mind they're also high in carb. So if you're having legumes like beans or lentils at your meals, you want to watch the carbs on your plate too, because you want to overdo it with the carbs. So sometimes you need to kind of treat the beans like a carb and um, a protein. Um, but there's lots of great al uh, alternatives too for, for plant-based like nuts and seeds are great. Um, when it comes to tofu, I usually recommend like tempeh, which is that fermented tofu. So again, you're getting more um, gut health benefits to it as well. Um, so yeah, there's lots of awesome protein alternatives for that too. But yeah, beans are, are a great one. Some people might, you know, fart a lot with them or not break them down properly. And that all has to do with the sulfur component in them. And it just means that we don't have that enzyme to properly break down enough sulfur but as our body eats more of them, we get used to it and that will decrease. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Okay. They've got lots more questions. So how often do you recommend snacking in between meals to help reduce meal sizing and portion sizes for children? And is it different for children than for adults? That's my little question. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. So I would treat it very similar, um, but be more like, it's more important for children basically, cause they're more active, right? Um, so with start with adults, for example, is if you're going, if your meals are more than five hours apart, you wanna add a snack in there ideally. So again, six hours or more between meals, you wanna have a snack between those meals. If your meals are four hours apart, you don't need to worry about a snack. And then now when it comes to children, again, they're very active moving around lots. It wouldn't be a bad idea just to always have a snack between um, your meal times, especially if they're kind of like three meals a day is incorporating a snack. And again, it's best to have a little bit of protein in there um, to help with the blood sugars. Great. And do you have recommendations for swapping breads or any recommendations for a healthier bread? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when it comes to bread, um, just keep in mind, it's that refined carb. So the um, the flour based food. So it's not to eliminate them, but in terms of gut health, if you're focused on your gut health is how much of those you're having. And that's a big one I see too, um, in terms of the weight. So weight loss is, um, looking at your refined sugar or your fine flour intake too. But in terms of breads is sprouted bread is a good option because it contains sprouted grains. And when grains are sprouted, we digest them a lot easier. So especially if someone's slightly sensitive to some grains or they don't, they get bloated after having bread is try the um, sprouted version of bread. So most of these are in the freezer section of your grocery store. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, now a hormonal question. Do you recommend inositol to aid in hormonal balance? Yeah, so um, everyone's, uh, in terms of supplements, I can't really specifically recommend anything specific because it's everyone's different. Um, it depends on what's going on for you. But inositol is used often for helping regulate blood sugars. So if you have struggled with that insulin resistance, if you've been diagnosed with that, um, another one is if you're feeling hungry all the time and you, you're struggling with that three to five hour rule or you're grazing a lot, sometimes that inositol um, can help. So it just supports um, blood sugars and that leptin and ghrelin. So those hormones that make you hungry and make you full. Um, but again, you want to work with a practitioner before that um, because inositol is also herbal. So with any herbal supplements and that is you want to definitely work with a practitioner. Okay, great. Um, a question about sleep. Any suggestions to sleep better? I take take melatonin to get to sleep, but can't stay asleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just kind of going back to um, when we chatted about sleep. So if you're falling asleep, okay. Um, but it's more of a waking up in the middle of the night. So it, it could be a few things It could be what you're eating before bed. Um, if it's dropping your blood sugar, so no protein before, if you're not having protein before bed, it could be um, that gut, gut bacteria imbalance. Um, it could also be a food sensitivity that you're not aware of. Um, or it can be a hormone related thing. So more on the cortisol, high cortisol. Um, so again, things that we can do to support that. Mm -hmm. So yes, lots of questions still, <laughs> which is great. No, I love this. Good discussion. My son can't tell when he's full. How much protein, fat, veggies, carbs should I be feeding my 11-year-old son to promote growth and good health while combating the tendency towards overeating and obesity? And I think this is probably helpful for a few other people. And this is, I think, what the person earlier was referring to, the tendency to overeat sometimes or sometimes under eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So ensuring um, there's protein on that plate. So a serving of protein or meat um, is a deck of cards, the palm of your hand, and that's around 25 grams of protein. So that's kind of like an average amount of protein at your lunch and supper. Usually breakfast is, is, is lower around 15 grams of protein. So that would be like two eggs, but ensuring they're having enough protein on their plate. Um, and then what's and for overeating is it's think of your stomach. Um, so your stomach, it only holds so much, um, but it does shrink and expand over time. But the fiber rich foods like your veggies, um, those complex carbs, that's going to make they expand in your stomach and they make you feel fuller. So if a meal has no vegetables or fiber in it, um, we tend to eat overeat. Um, so again, going back to that, that pasta example is you want to add lots, hide lots of veggies in it. So it's looking, it's roughly close to half the plate veggies, um, or you can add on the side veggies to it as well. And then, yeah, that carbs looking at more of the complex carbs. So versus the refined, so pasta is made from flour. So it would be the refined carb. So having more of those, those complex carbs in your plate. So looking at the fiber, um, the protein content, and then to touch on fats is ideally some healthy fat on your plate too. So that could be butter, that could be olive oil, that could be avocado oil, that could be olives, that could be nuts, seeds. So having some form of, of healthy fat in there, usually it's what you're cooking with, right? So you can kind of include that as your healthy fat. So I would focus on, on ensuring those things are in place. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, now a question about vitamins and supplements. Um, and this question, there's a few particular brands mentioned. I'm not going to read them out because one, I don't think we need want to go into uh, promoting one brand over another. But I think, um, uh, Andrea, if you can give some general information on how do we get objective information on vitamin supplements, on their quality control, on their assurance, all of those things. Um, yeah, the retail stores don't usually have that information and the company websites don't give full disclosure either. So what, mm -hmm. what can you advise? 
Yeah, it's it's really it's tricky. So um, like unlike medications, supplements aren't regulated. And some companies can put, you know, whatever dose they kind of want, or they can put really poor quality things in them. So again, go to a health food store if you have one near to you. Um, another option is online. So there's online health food stores like VitaSave is one, um, healthyplanet.com is one too. So there's tons of online health food stores you can easily order from as well. And again, they will likely have those quality supplements, whereas you're less likely to get a quality supplement if you go into um, just a store again that has a mix of things. So going to a health food store for those. Um, and then for example, I can quickly touch on two to, to look at is if you're getting a B complex or a multivitamin is to look for methyl, methylated B vitamins. So in the front of some of the words, you'll see methyl. So two of them being B12. So it's gonna say cyanocobalamin, that's a synthetic form. And 50% of the population can't convert that synthetic form to its active form. So you're taking in a supplement that's not even doing much for you, right? So it's a lot of waste and money. Um, so looking for methyl cobalamine versus the cyanocobalamin. Um, and then the other one I want to mention is fish oil. If you are taking fish oil, that's the one of the most important to get quality versions of because fish oil, it's an oil and it can be easily become rancid. And when it becomes rancid, it just creates inflammation and it does the opposite of what omega threes do is anti-inflammatory, right? So getting a good quality fish oil, if you're taking one, you'll usually see them in like a, a tinted bottle. Um, so you want to look for that tinted bottle because the light doesn't get through and heat doesn't get exposed to it as much. Um, next question, a sourdough bread spatter. Uh, so sourdough breads are um, better than regular unsprouted bread. Yes. Um, so sourdough bread is a fermented food, right? So there's some fermentation in the process. So it is better for gut health. So yes, yeah, sourdough breads are a good option. Mm -hmm. Great. And then uh, does carbonated beverages or do carbonated beverages, including carbonated water, hinder indigestion and impact the gut? What are some good swaps? Yeah, so carbonated beverages, as long as there's no artificial sweeteners or sugar added to them are a great um, water alternative. And they don't impact um, things negatively in terms of gut health. Um, that would be, again, more so those refined sugars and the um, artificial sweeteners. So, yeah, carbonated water that has no sugar, no um, artificial sweeteners is a good option. So that's a good option alternative to, like, the pops, right? So even diet pop, regular pop, um, and then another thing on that note is kombucha. So those who are really into their pop and can't, you know, get past that sweetness um, is to try test out kombucha because kombucha is naturally pretty sweet. And again, you want to shoot for the lower sugar ones, but you're going to get benefits with that with the probiotics. So sometimes swapping out the pop with a kombucha. And now with kombucha, you want to don't go overboard with them because again, they have a lot of natural sugar. So I usually say um, two cups a week is a good amount. So Usually a bottle is two cups. And sorry, I might have been uh, looking at the next question, but what did you say about the carbonated water? Like, you know, using a soda stream or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so great option. Um, you just want to avoid the artificial sweeteners. So a lot of the drops that they use do have artificial sweeteners in them. So that would be like aspartame, um, sucralose. Those are all artificial sweeteners. Whereas a good swap can be stevia. So you can get stevia drops and add it to your soda stream instead. Um, so yeah, you just want to avoid the high sugar ones and the artificial sweeteners. Great, great. Okay, next question. Can my son who has ADHD take magnesium? What is the recommended dose as well for adults? What would be the dose? So the son is 11. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so magnesium is one of the most common mineral deficiencies. And again, it's our calming mineral. Um, so looking at for yourself, for example, is, you know, stress eats it up, lack of sleep eats it up, coffee, sugar, alcohol, those all eat up magnesium. 
Um, so it's a calming mineral. So we just kind of think, you know, if you feel like you need some more calmness, if you're constipated, if you're not sleeping well, those are all kind of symptoms of low magnesium. And now with dosage is it's very individualized. So again, it depends on you where you're at with things. Um, so I can't recommend a specific dose. It would just be to follow what's on the back of the bottle. Um, and then in terms of which is the low, probably the lowest dose they do suggest on there. So follow what's on the back of the bottle and there's different forms of magnesium. So be cautious with that too. Um, so the one I suggest is bisglycinate. So bisglycinate is the most um, absorbable form of magnesium. And if you do um, what the bottle says, the lowest dose, then that's definitely a safe option for you um, and your son. And then, yeah, it doesn't come until you dose higher that you really want to work with a practitioner, um, which I'll often say a lot of us need a lot more than that. Um, and then if it's more of on the constipation side is citrate, magnesium citrate targets the bowel directly. So you might want to get a citrate form versus the bisglycinate. And with that, thank you very much, Andrea. It's been wonderful having you on there. And thank you. It was great to see all these questions. Uh, for you to answer all the questions it was really awesome and no, the information for having me yeah really yeah. valuable thank you and if, again if anyone has more questions and feel free to reach out great no question is a dumb question mm -hmm. okay and there's a few people in the questions and chat saying thank you as well so <laughs> that's awesome. really good okay and thank you to our lovely production team that's been on doing this and they'll be uh, putting it all into a recording for anyone who missed it. They'll be able to catch it uh, once we post it on the website. And for sure, we'll send the recipe out tomorrow. Great. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Mm -hmm.